Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds. On October 31st, a scientist, Marco Kaltofen, made a presentation at the American Public Health Association. They met in Washington, D.C. Mr. Kaltofen was asked to make uh, a presentation because he specializes in measuring radiation in the environment. I basically summarized what Mr. Kaltofen said and had his PowerPoint presentation on October 31st. Since then, a professional photographer who was at the American Public Health Association meeting has donated the video he took of Mr. Kaltofen making the presentation in person. Today, we're posting Mr. Kaltofen's video and the, power, the original PowerPoint that we uh, talked about back in October on our site. So you can get to see and hear in Mr. Kaltofen's own words, the severity of the problem of hot particles throughout the world. This is a triumph for Worcester Polytechnic Institute, for SafeCast, and for hundreds of other people around the world who provided Mr. Kaltofen with information which he could use in his analysis. It truly is crowdsourcing on the internet at its best. It allows us to take control of the information that is being analyzed. And um, as I said in my video a month ago now, if we had let the government do this work, I don't think we ever would have known the severity of the problem in Japan. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, my research work is on not so much radiation, but on the things that carry the radiation uh, to people. So what I've been studying has been what happens to dust after it becomes contaminated and how that dust carries radiation to the human body. Uh, I have to say that I have no personal financial relationships with commercial interests relevant to this presentation during the past 12 months. In doing this research, I have a few people I'd like to thank in particular I'd like to thank the volunteers of SafeCast. SafeCast is a group of both technical and non-technical volunteers in Japan who have been working since the March 11 earthquake, tsunami, and radiation release to try and document some of the radiation exposures people are experiencing in northern Japan. Uh, the central theme of my work is that the dust contaminated with fallout uh, follow from the Fukushima accidents is the source of human exposure to radiation. And you have probably, if you've seen some of the media coverage of radiation exposure in Japan, you've probably heard a lot of different ways that people have talked about how we're exposed to radiation and how it compares to our daily lives. And I'm actually going to ask for a show of hands. Am I allowed to do this? Sure. Has anyone heard the radiation in Japan being compared to, say, taking a flight from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C.? Okay. How about to eating a banana? Has anyone heard this one? Bananas have potassium. Potassium has a natural radioactive isotope. So we get a certain amount of, of low-level radiation from that exposure. The last question. Has anyone heard that a little bit of low-level radiation might actually be good for you? This is a, a hypothesis by uh, Dr. Ed Calabrese that a very small amount of radiation may actually cause what amounts to uh, something analogous to an immun immunological response. Sorry, I'm a civil engineer. I can't say those medical words. That response is actually a, a net positive at very, very low levels. So what we're talking about here is a slightly different kind of radiation where we're looking at a lot of concentrated radiation in a very small particle. So the total amount of radiation we're exposed to might in fact be low, but because we're exposing only a small number of tissues, for instance, for a respirable dust particle, uh, we inhale the dust particle that's radioactive, it actually is about the same scale of size as a, as a cell in the human lung. And so that, that radioactive particle is um, adjacent to a cell. It's going to stay there because it has a long residence time. And so to that particular cell, 
that's not a very low dose. In fact, that's a high dose, potentially even a lethal dose to that cell. Although overall, it's a very low level of exposure to the entire human body. So let's look at some of the things that were released by the reactors at Fukushima. Uh, radioiodine, iodine-131. This is a short-lived gas. It tends to decay by about half every eight days. Cesium-134 and cesium-137, these have half-lives of about two years or 30 years, respectively. By the way, have people heard this term, half-lives? We talked about radioisotopes. Thank you. Cobalt-60 has a half-life of about five years. A whole zoo of what are called fission wastes and neutron activation products. These are the materials that poison nuclear fuels over time when they're in the reactor. And then, of course, the original uranium and plutonium fuels that are in the reactor and other transuranics, uh, heavier than uranium isotopes like americium and neptunium, which are very specific to that uranium. And for how people are exposed to this radiation, there are several different vectors, several different ways these dusts will actually get into the human body. Uh, number one is going to be the inhalation of airborne particles, uh, followed by the, the inhalation of resuspended dusts. The difference being, Early on in the accidents, we have a lot of material emitted into the air. It's washed out by rain. It falls out as a settled dust. And then over time, the atmosphere clears, but sometimes those dusts, when they collect in a certain place, are going to resuspend, and the air will become contaminated again after a, a short downtime. People also ingest contaminated foods. Uh, the list I've put here, these are foods which have already been found to be contaminated with unacceptable levels of radiation. Uh, things like seaweed, shellfish, beef, milk, spinach, eggs, tea, fin fish. I should add mushrooms and uh, other things that are grown not just in the immediate area of the reactors, but sometimes as much as a couple hundred miles away. And if any of you are used to working uh, with juvenile health issues and you're familiar with uh, contamination from lead paint in dusts in homes, we also tend to, especially as children, ingest a good deal of soils and dusts. Uh, the EPA tells us that the average child is ingesting about a tenth of a gram of dust every day. I don't know about you, but I remember my kids when they were little, they say sometimes it might be as much as a gram or even a gram and a half of dust a day. That's an important way people are exposed to contaminated soils. And lastly, there's dermal contact, getting this material on the outside. <clears throat> So we tried to take a look at certain samples that would tell us a little bit about how dusts are moving through the environment in Japan. So we looked at automobile air filters. We tried this as a, as a qualitative means of trying to capture a large number of radioactive particles so that we could learn about how those particles are in terms of their size, how they might dissolve in human body fluids, to capture enough particles that we could statistically analyze how they would behave in the environment and in the body. Uh, as it turns out, the way the average Japanese driver uses their car, the amount of air consumed by a car in Japan is actually on the same order of magnitude as the amount of air that people use day to day. So a car versus a healthy worker will use anywhere between 10 to 30 cubic meters of air a day on average for the car obviously to burn the fuel. And to follow up on that, we also used a number of quantitative air filters. These are small metered filters running with air pumps that are taking an exact known amount of air and cutting off the specific particle size with a known amount. We can't get as many particles with this method, but we can use it to calibrate what the actual concentration is of hot particles in the atmosphere. We looked at home air filters from people's homes in Japan and in the US. We also looked at children's shoes. Children track in a lot of material on their shoes. Children play very hard in outdoor soils, and their shoes tend to pick up any contaminants that are in the soil. We also looked at settled dust in the home, surface soils, and foods and plants in Japan and the US. Uh, our air sampling stations were set up at multiple locations. The first sampling station was the one I set up in Massachusetts about two hours after I learned of the reactor accidents because we look at the map and we can see we're at the same latitude as these reactors in Massachusetts. So that over time we're likely to see some of that material make its way in the atmosphere to us. We also set up uh, facilities in Seattle, San Francisco, Boulder, Hawaii, 
and the multiple facilities in Japan, just two of them are here on the map. Uh, the primary radioisotopes we detected, the things we actually found in our dust samples, the cesium-134 and the cesium-137. Uh, iodine-131, which, uh, as you know, is a thyroid seeker, but with a short half-life. We only saw iodine-131 back in, in April. And even the samples we had in storage, you could see the iodine slowly decaying those. Cobalt-60, which is another activation product from uh, deep inside the reactor. The cobalt-60 is formed from steels in the reactor uh, that are exposed to radiation. So obviously somehow the steel at the center of the reactor must have um, come in contact with the atmosphere. And then other fission products as well. Uh, this is a quick map. I don't know if anyone has seen this before. This is a, a, a general map uh, taken by an aircraft over a Fukushima prefecture that shows uh, pretty much where most of the plume has gone. So if you'll notice, we have evacuation radii. We have a 20 kilometer uh, zone around which people have been evacuated from the other reactors. But in fact, because of the weather and the geography, you can see how most of this material has moved to the northwest. Uh, the permissible radiation dose, I'm not gonna focus on this for very long, let me just say that the, the permissible radiation doses in Fukushima Prefecture were raised by a factor of 20. Um, there's obviously a lot more to this decision than I could ever get into in 15 minutes. Uh, our sampling team uh, experienced uh, a few difficulties in getting the materials they need. Probably the biggest one is in working with our <coughs> excuse me, volunteers, teaching them how to collect these samples safely get them safely and lawfully to the United States to be analyzed. And here's some of the data. Uh, one of the first things we did was we took our automobile air filters from different locations and we opened them up and you laid the filter paper inside these air filters on a piece of x-ray film and developed them. On the far left we have an automobile air filter that operated during March, April and May in Seattle, Washington. It, uh, it looks clear. If your eyes are really good you can see one tiny little dot near the center. Uh, we have an automobile air filter from Tokyo, and you can see that each one of these black spots represents a radioactive particle that was trapped on the filter paper and exposed the X-ray film. And also we have uh, Fukushima City, which is uh, about 65 kilometers away from the site. Uh, this uh, automobile air filter is actually hazardous. My university is annoyed with me because we have to contract to have this filter disposed of as radioactive waste. Uh, unfortunately, you can just imagine what this means for people in, in Fukushima City, which is not that great. And even for the mechanics that are handling these air filters. Uh, here's a look at one of the particles. We're using a scanning electron microscope to actually see the particle itself. This is a hot radioactive particle. It's about oh, 10 microns across, meaning it is a respirable-sized particle. This is one of the very few particles where we found americium, which is a byproduct of uh, plutonium decay. Uh, quick comparison. This is the total radiation in children's shoes from uh, Koniyama, which is in Fukushima Prefecture. This city is actually featured in today's Wall Street Journal. You can see that the total radiation levels in the shoes from uh, Fukushima are higher for these children than in the U.S. And here we have the total amount of cesium, radio cesium, which is probably the most problematic isotope people are exposed to there. And you can see that the cesium levels are more than 166 times higher in the shoes from Fukushima. So these are actually shoes worn by children in schools and brought home. Uh, we're finding that the laces and the soles are probably the two peak contaminated areas on the shoes. The soles from contact with soils. It's possible that the laces are actually contaminated from contact with the fingers. Uh, since the accidents about eight months ago, the airborne levels have dropped. Uh, the soil levels still remain high in, in places, but the food chain radiation we're still finding increasing. Uh, this radiation is not uniform. There are hot spots, particularly in Fukushima Prefecture, where we might have zones that are relatively radiation free now that may experience uh, net increases as some of the radiation from hot spots tends to build up. And for an air filter that was run in Noda City, just north of Tokyo, 150 kilometers from the accident site, uh, an indoor home air filter showed 230 picocuries of radiation. I should just say that uh, the U.S. limits radiation in soils to about five picocuries. Uh, for the United States, in Boston, we had uh, a, a one-month period where we saw beta and alpha radiation based on particles increasing. 
And in Seattle, we actually had a two-week period where we had four to five hot particles of 